You're listening to the Team Stripes Podcast, the podcast for hockey referees. Each show, we discuss the world of officiating and find out that not everything is in black and white. Here's your host, Brandon Bourgeois. Paul, I just wanted to thank you, uh, first of all, just for, for helping us out and, and chatting. Um, just for our, our listeners out there, uh, Paul has officiated over 1,000 regular season games, 49 playoff games. He's worked the Canada Cup in 1987 and 91, as well as two All-Star games. And uh, Paul, I just was uh, wondering if you could fill in with some special memories for you and uh, you know some special experiences in your time as a referee in the NHL. Well, as you mentioned, the 87 Canada Cup, game two all of the three games in that series ended at six five and my game was in game two was double overtime i i disallowed two russian goals i put canada down two men in the first period uh alan eagleson accused me of not helping canada which i didn't know that was my job i thought i was there to referee <laughs> and uh fortunately for me and the way that the game was played that Kaminsky and Fatisov and Larionov and uh, on the Ameri- on the Canadian side Bork and, and Gretzky and, and Lemieux had nights that people dream about and of course Gretzky had five assists and Lemieux had a hat trick and I think you look and Grant Fuhr played out of his mind so when you look at all of these things and you say uh, which game stands out that would be one the other was my first game in the NHL, which was not a game that I was I was assigned to. I was assigned uh, to observe with John McCauley watching Montreal at Boston the last week of the regular season with the Canadians and the Bruins fighting over second place, which in those days in the Adams division was home ice for the Stanley Cup playoffs. Well, I disallowed what was a Bruins goal after I went in to replace the injured Dave Newell in the second period. I was on the ice for 30 seconds and disallowed the goal and subsequently knew that I might have been a little quick on the whistle. Well, I still had to do about another 30 minutes of that game. And as John McCauley, the late great uh, director of officiating, said to me that I didn't fail him. And I refereed the game and went about my business. And I think I set my mark there, which was, I, I had enough guts to make the tough calls and live with them and move along. And uh, I, I think those two games and certainly the comeback game I had on November 13th in 1998 when I came back from my stage three colon cancer and I had been told that I, I wasn't going to live six months and I was able to survive and make my comeback in Jersey with uh, the Penguins playing and Yager came out and gave me a hug. And I, I'll never forget that night and how terrific it was just to be able to be back skating. And a lot of people don't know that I was doing those games and I was taking a daily dose of chemo both in the morning and at night. And chemo, as people may have known from their own personal experience or or from what they've heard is pretty tough. It's debilitating. But there was a certain something about me that tough meant that I was up for the challenge. And away we went. When you got back to refereeing games, how did that change your perspective? Did it change you as a referee? Did it, did it harden your resolve? I mean, what were the challenges that you faced around that? Well, the physical challenges were just being able to keep my meals down and not be so fatigued and dehydrated and all of the things that happen because of the ravages of that disease and the medicine. Sometimes the cure is worse than the illness. But in my situation, if I hadn't had the chemo, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now because I was that I had a second tumor on my liver and I had a primary tumor in my colon. And I think because of the, the medicine and the surgery and my physical conditioning, I was in great shape going in that I was able to fight off the disease and the effects of the chemo. And the chemo was the only thing I think that, or at least I was told by the doctors, that gave me a chance to survive. 
I think a lot of listeners out there that are listening, a lot of games they work, they might think that there's no allies for them out there, but I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, the family aspect of the game of hockey. Well, I think you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right that there is a family aspect, and a lot of people don't understand that even in the best of families that we do argue and we do have moments where we're not getting along so well. But as I've explained to a lot of people, we who are in hockey uh, uh, up to our chins in it, at least, or very top of our heads, understand that friction is part of the game and we love the friction and that we confront each other and then afterwards we let it go and it's done. But as fierce as as the competition and as fierce as the friction is, so too is how great the loyalty is amongst hockey people. And that even though I may have called a bad penalty against the Bruins, when I came back to Boston, they gave me 100 tickets for all the people in the hospital that worked on my case and helped me. And they had a huge party for my first game back. And I have to say that, you know, that type of thing brings some tears to my eyes and and a little bit of humility to, to me that people were that great when I was up against it. Your story is one that I've known for a while and it's pretty amazing when you think about it and switching themes a little bit here. I wanted to get your perspective on how the NHL has changed since your era. How have you seen it evolve and how have you seen maybe the role of a referee change in that time? Well, on the playing front, the aspect of the equipment has made a great difference in the game. And certainly the goaltending pads, the uh, composite sticks, the lighter weight equipment, the faster drying sweaters. Back in the day when I was playing, the sweaters were actually uh, heavy and wool and they got wet and uh, wasn't a lot of fun. And in the minors, we would throw our bags under the bus and get to the next city and put on cold starch stiff uniforms that were more ice than they were sweat and the emphasis now is on speed it's on uh, a more reckless style there are less uh, of, of the uh, of the uh, crashing and banging that that there was in in the day when the flyers and the bruins uh led the league and in wins and stanley cups and all of those things but also they had skill. When you think of the 70 and 72 Bruins and you think about Bobby Orr, well, probably, if not the greatest, one of the top three greatest players that ever played. And you look at other different players along the way that were extremely skilled, but they also had a degree of toughness. But there was a, a, a more of a, a semblance of system versus uh, now it's, it's speed and, of course, the red line's gone, and then the tag-up rule. So the, the the whole dynamic has changed. The game's changed. It's not what it was. Yeah, no, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm just saying that that's the way that the owners and the general managers are crafting their, their clubs. The other aspect is we see players now prior to the game doing stretching and kicking soccer balls and playing foot hockey and all this other stuff, and their diet is different. Well, We, we were steak and potato guys, and usually before the game, the amount of stretching we did was to reach for the newspaper, have a smoke <laughs> and a cup of coffee. And I think that overall, those things – and certainly nutrition and off-season training have made it such that, that when players arrived at training camp back in my day, and even the referees, we went to camp to get in shape. Now the players come and the officials come in shape. Dave Smith works with the referees now, and he's been with them for 20-plus years, and he's the trainer, and he – keeps an eye on the conditioning and the injuries of of the officials. Back in the day, we relied upon the home team uh, trainer or athletic fitness person to to help us, you know, with our pulled groin or our stiff back or take the stitches out of our chin or whatever the case might be. And as I tell people, a lot of people don't perhaps get it, but, you know, I, I, I was on the ice in those days. I had little, little elbow pads, little, little shin pads, a cup, a whistle, a sweater, and a pair of wool, black wool pants. That was it. There were no equipment. There was no helmets. There were no visors. There were no mouthpieces. And we just played the game or we refereed the game 
uh, <laughs> relying upon intuitiveness and luck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, and it's amazing. I'll watch I mean, some of the games you were doing, and it's amazing. You'd see, you know, a player chip the puck past the defenseman. His partner would basically grab him and, you know, slow the guy down while his partner was getting the puck. And nowadays, you don't, you wouldn't, see, you'd never see that, right? Well, there was a br- guy named Brad Marsh that played for a long time with Philadelphia and played with Ottawa. And I don't think he could skate three strides without holding on to somebody. <laughs> and the fact is that we, I used to say to him, did you get enough crazy glue on your gloves tonight? And, I'd, <laughs> and we would laugh about that. But, uh, you know, everybody had their forte, everybody had their game. And uh, it was, you know, partially uh, like a Gordie Howe going into the corners. You knew that if you took the puck away from him you were going to get an elbow in the side of the head so (laughs) there was a certain aspect to the game that people looked forward to and I I would say that overall I was one who learned quickly and adapted rapidly one one big thing you were talking about athleticism and when you're doing three man is that harder than doing four man today when I broke into officiating in the early 80s the referee was by himself and I had two linesmen and you necessarily had to count on linesmen to move into the zone to cover the net because you couldn't always make it from the goal line to the red line where the pass could go to up to the red line and then from there breaking in. And when you had guys like Yvonne Cornwyer and Billy Barber and guys that could really fly, then you, you, you really had to, to be able to motor and then all of a sudden, in the mid-90s, we added the second referee. I, have, in fact, refereed the first game in the NHL in the modern era with two referees, Fraser and myself, Kevin Collins, and Pat DePuzo at Madison Square Garden. And what's interesting about that is that, that uh, all of a sudden, Fraser and I aren't skating forwards. We're now skating more than half of the time backwards. There, there is no way, there is no way that a person could do a three-man game. There is no way in this world with the red line out, because of the fact that there's no referee, there's no human being that can get from goal line to goal line in five seconds, and yet the puck now is moving so fast, and the passes are, are off the glass. The glass is so hot that the bounce of the puck makes it almost impossible to gauge where it's going. And so the two referees, the way it is, has to be that way, with the linesman even helping out. And I think that people don't understand it's a fast game, and it's also a game that the players are bigger now. I mean, the average player back, my grandfather coached Chicago in the 30s, and the average player back in those days was like 5'8", 5'9". Occasionally you'd (laughs) see a six-footer but not a lot. But when you think about, when you look at, at, at the Las Vegas team, I mean, they're a big team. When you when you look at, at Washington and, and you look at their big Russian guy there, I mean, he's 240 pounds, Ovechkin. And, and you got to understand, he's pushing 240 pounds. Back in the day, that's twice as much as players weighed. Some of the players I played against were 140, 145 pounds. Davey Keon wasn't a big guy, but he was quick and clever. But when you look at him versus Ovechkin, Ovechkin, if they ever ran into Keon, they'd be scraping Keon up off the <laughs> garden's ice. I'd go down the list and just tell you that if you ran into uh, Tony Twist or Brad May or Rob Ray or Domi or any of those guys, yeah. uh, you had your hands full. And those were the guys I was reffing. And then the guys I was playing against, like O'Reilly and Jonathan and Secord, were all extremely tough and they could also play hockey. So, you know, seeing a guy like John Wensink, who had 29 goals one year put for the Bruins, and that was the year that, like, 15 of them had 20 goals playing for Cherry, that uh, it, 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 it was testimony to the ability of tough players to also produce as hockey players. Yeah, and you need a little bit of courage to play this game, too, and I think that that era kind of personified that. <laughs> It was my it was my only key to the uh, to the uh, to the National League or the WHA was the, my ability to fight and I had to fight in order to get in the door because uh, a I was a minority 
Mm-hmm. As an American, there weren't many. And the second part of it was that I came from leagues that we averaged 15 or 20 games in a year. We would play on Wednesdays and Saturdays versus the Canadian junior players that would come out, even those that went to uh, from Tier 2 or, or Junior B to American colleges. They, they would go from 70, 80 games to 35, 40 American college games. And I was going upwards from 15 or 20 games. And and we didn't have all the ice and all the experience, but I, I had one ticket and I used it. I followed your uh, blog pretty closely, and I still laugh. One term that I know you hate is the term game management. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, that's one blog post of yours that I read and I kind of laughed at. I'm wondering if you could provide your take on the way that you managed the game back in the 80s and 90s. Well, primarily the aspect of game management means that you are balancing or finding a way to think through the game and you're not reacting. And in my style of management of a game, which really was to let it unfold, and my teachers, the people that helped me, not only my dad and John McCauley and and Frank Advari and, and others, who were all Hall of Fame guys, I mean, Scotty Morrison and, and other different people who, who supervised me along the way, they brought hundreds of years of experience into my, into my repertoire so that I could take a game and understand that whatever happens tonight is going to happen again tomorrow. So I was constantly learning, even up until the last game I ever refereed in the NHL. I looked at the tape and knew that there were two or three things I could have done better. And I think that that's an aspect of, of your own personal management that you need to be honest with yourself and understand uh, when you make a mistake, it's usually because of positioning or lack of hustle or a bad sight line. And I think that those are things that I try to stress when I teach officiating and coach officials into being better. But with regard to what constitutes a penalty, my recipe was very simple. If they had done it to me and I was playing and I'd be ticked off and I'd want to go fight them, that probably was a penalty. Mm-hmm. If they did it to my teammate and I wanted to jump the bench and go out and beat the tar out of them, that probably was a penalty. And last but not least, if I was sitting on the end of the bench and my teammate did something stupid to a guy on the other team and I put my hand across my eyes and said, well, my gosh, why did he do that? Then no doubt that was a penalty. Mm -hmm. So those are the things I tried to bring into the soup so that when it, when it all came out, it tasted the way I wanted it. Not too salty, not too hot, just right for me. (laughs) And I had to be consistent with me. And for our listeners out there listening, if you you did have a pretty good playing career. And uh, as you've mentioned previously, you, you were, you had a fighting role to a certain extent and I'm curious, when you made that transition from player uh, to referee, did that help you at all? I mean, it helped me, but it hurt me sometimes too because uh, one of my first games in the American League, the Islanders had Springfield as their farm team, and Al Arbor was down to watch some of the games, and he was sitting with Jack Butterfield, who was the president of the league, and Gordy Anziano, who was the vice president of the American Hockey League, and it's the old Springfield. Uh, Indians, which were then, I think, the Falcons. But long story short, two guys dropped their gloves and they started shadow boxing and going around and around. And 20 seconds went by, and 30, and then 40. And finally, I said, "Hey, you two guys, had to start punching each other. I'm going to take this whistle off and kick the hell out of both of you." <laughs> well, the management really didn't <laughs> didn't find that as amusing as 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 the players on the bench did. But you know, that was my style. And I brought into the game a little bit of, of my knowledge of having played and watched. And I was the reason there was a referee when I was the player. So, you know, I understood all the different roles. And I had been playing with a lot of great players, Mike Gartner and Messier and, and uh, Robbie Fatorik and Tardif. And I played with a lot of great players and played against a lot of great players. So there were, I played against Frank Mahavlic, Gordy Howe, Bobby Hull. I mean, th- these are legend names. And when you look at, at the various 
things that they did. And then I would see players out there flipping and flopping and trying to, you know, a bunch of flounders that, you know, that would sort of tick me off. And I'd, I'd skate over and say, you stay on your feet or I'm going to skate right over your face. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you kind of bridge the topic that I wanted to talk about. And uh, you're bringing back all these memories and, you know, you get the vivid image of the referees out there that had personality. Back in the day, you guys had the name bars on there. Everybody knew who you were. You know, you could have a Kerry Frazier out there, a Paul Stewart out there. You had a reputation and, you, you know, you had a relationship with players. Whereas nowadays, at least to my eyes, it doesn't seem like there's that relationship uh, with a lot of guys. Do you see that and do you find that's hurt the game at all or that plays a role? I'm not sure what management in the National Hockey League tells players. I don't know what management in the National Hockey League tells referees and linesmen. I don't know because it's not what I tell my people. I tell my people, when you get to the rink and the game starts at 7.05, you don't start refereeing until the players tell you they need you, and they'll tell you by their actions. They're going to show you that they need you, and that's when you step up. Until then, you're just a paid observer. And just watch the game and let it unfold and allow the players to feel themselves out and get their legs going. And then along the way, you know, if somebody says something, I, I, I said to a referee the other night that he called a two and a 10 on a guy. And I, I said to him, what did he say to you? He said, well, he called me a no good this and a no good that with a few expletives. And I said, well, maybe you are that. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he looked at me with this look and I said, you know, maybe you are a bit of a dink. Maybe you are a bit of an ass. I said, why wouldn't you just turn around and say to the player, okay, you've made your point. And then I would have turned and said to the coach, uh, what time are you going to start coaching this guy? Because if you don't want to coach him, I'll just sit him on the other side for 12 minutes. How's that? Yeah. And then I would skate away and put the onus back on the coach. And I think that these are things that I had a little bit of, of, of panache. And nobody could question my toughness. And there wasn't anybody that put on a pair of skates that was going to intimidate me. Not even the guys that didn't put on skates, such as the icons, Scotty Bowman or, or Pat Quinn or, or Mike Keenan or any of those other, Harrison. And none of those guys were going to scare me out of the rink. And I'm going to tell you, they paid me to do the job and I earned it. I earned every penny and I never gave anybody less than 100%. Yeah, so you're saying here you never back down. I mean, uh, I would assume you're probably using a little bit of humor with these guys. I mean, what what are sort of the things that you're teaching your your officials now uh, in terms of like communication? What are what are the big things that you're you're stressing to to your to your guys and well, You're not a traffic cop. Don't put your hand up and say I'm not talking to you. Mm -hmm. What you do is you the coach is barking at you. You call the captain over and say your coach has a lot of. Uh, things to say tell him to calm down and i'll talk to him in a minute but if he keeps putting on a show he might be the only show in the in the washroom because he'll be in taking a shower and I, <laughs> we'll be out here right no seriously yeah. and i've i've said i i've said to my people you know you have to have a tolerance and a patience remember you're 40 and that player is 18 mm -hmm. you wouldn't give him the keys to a fast car and tell them just go drive any way you want as fast as you want. So you got to understand they're going to make mistakes. You are forty. You should be smarter than them. Use your brain. Use your experience. And that those are the things that I try to boil it down to to make it more human and more simplistic, so that they understand that this isn't life and death, and they don't have to be Adolf Hitler every night that they step on the ice. And they are last but not last but not least. I had fun out there. I enjoyed the game. I loved watching the players play. And I, yeah, if I kibitzed with them, so what? Because I might say to a player that that was one of the greatest shifts I've ever seen. Or another guy, you know, I'd say, you really going to fight him? <laughs> I said to a kid one night, first shift, he's standing there and Gretzky's on the other side. I said, hey, kid, is this your first game? He goes, yeah. I said, and do you really think you're going to win this faceoff? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Huh? So, you know, you, you sort of have some fun with this. And, and remember, it's a game. It's a game. Yeah. Um, and no, people this, want to be entertained. Yeah. So entertain them. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And like a lot of our podcasts here, the whole idea was to try and start teaching officials. And, 
you know, get the great knowledge that guys like you would, would be able to tell. I know you were involved with college hockey now, and you've been involved with the uh, Continental Hockey League previously in uh, teaching officials and, you know, being a supervisor. Um, and I'm wondering uh, for our listeners out there, if you could talk about what is it that you look for in uh, aspiring referees? I look for, first of all, fitness. Conditioning allows for positioning. You have to remember that a game of hockey is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And you're going to be out there for at least 60 minutes. So you better be in shape. That's the first thing. Second thing, Frank Advari said this to me, excuses are for losers. If you make a mistake, own it. Get into the game and allow the players to understand that you're sweating you're working, and when they turn around and start to argue, you have your arm in the air and blow the whistle for a penalty, and you're seven feet from them, how are they going to argue with you? Mm-hmm. So you get to the action and feel the game. Anticipate. Don't overreact. Let it flow. And as I say, Wally Harris once supervised the game I had, and I call one penalty. And when he walked in the dressing room at the end of the game, he said, you ruined that game. Should have been a no-hitter. We could have been out of here 10 minutes ago. (laughs) (laughs) So I think keep keep it in perspective. Mm -hmm. But also understand, you see a team that's just coming off of two bad losses and they're trying like hell, don't bury them with a bad penalty. Make them earn their goals, their assists, and the penalties. Be frugal. Yeah. Be frugal. And you know what? I still have the case that I got my first whistle in. I barely used it, so I, I can give <laughs> it back anytime they want it. <laughs> still shiny and new? <laughs> yeah, still shiny, yeah. So that's, uh, I think, really good advice. And I'm wondering, for, for guys that are thinking about refereeing, because you came from a playing position to referee, and certainly I think the NHL has really promoted bringing in former players. What's your take on that? Is, is that a big push for you as well? Well, it's not necessarily the former players. You're hoping that they have the greatest love for the game, that they played as, and played as long as they could, and that their love for the game will translate into them wanting to stay in the game. And I tell people but my life in hockey is more like a big pizza. Each slice that I've had, I've driven the Zamboni, I've sharpened skates, I've made the ice, I've swept the seats, I've painted the toilets, I've done all that (laughs) stuff. Seriously. I've driven the bus. There's not too much I haven't done in the game. I've done radio, TV, I've done the playing, I've done the officiating, and I've done the coaching. And the fact is that if you love the game – You want to stay part of the game. And I look at a person like King Clancy who played for Toronto and he was a coach and a general manager and all of those things, but he also refereed. And I think that there's no job too big, no job too small. And that if you're part of the game, you should be happy in that. And I can promise you, there isn't a job in the game of hockey that I couldn't do and do successfully. Why? Because the last thing I would want to do is disappoint myself or hurt the game. And at this stage of my life and what I'm doing with the officials, the three or 400 I have here, and my legacy will be for them to have a smaller learning curve to go from being inexperienced and making capable of making mistakes to being experienced and able to keep the flow going. The best thing I tell referees is positioning sells calls, Excuses are for losers. And last but not least, a moving puck is your best friend. When the puck stops, that's when all the crap starts. Yeah, I heard this great analogy, I guess, once from Ron McLean, who said, refereeing a game is like holding a bird. You hold it too closely, you can kill the bird. You hold your your hand too open, the bird flies away. I mean, what, what's sort of the general takeaway of refereeing a game? You referee a game, and the rule book is your guide, and it's your shield. If you do it by the book and you use it as a guide with your ability to interpret how the players are playing, to feel them out, to get a sense of what the value of the plays are all about, what players are hitting the holes, what, what players aren't skating, they're throwing snow, what, what all, the fans are doing, all of that comes into it. It's like a, a big palette of paint and a painter painting. 
on on the on the on the banks of the river, trying to you know juvene and trying to uh, see 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 the beautiful colors. Well, all of this can be you as the referee. You can, you can be the guy that that helps shape that painting, but you have to have uh, an attitude of, of of firmness and fairness and courage. And if you have all of that, then I think you're going to to be able to uh, be a successful referee. I, I, I take exception, and I'm going to conclude with this. I take exception to people that say the best referees are the ones that referee a game and the next day you didn't know who they were. That may be good, and it might be a great statement for those that are refereeing in a game where nothing happens. But a really good referee is one that has enough courage to stand right out in the middle and disallow the winning goal because he's right. Yeah. No, that's, and uh, that's, that's what you need to find. Yeah. No, I think that's, Paul, that's, that's great advice. And uh, uh, certainly we appreciate your time to help our listeners and to improve and to uh, gain an appreciation for the game and certainly to share your memories and experiences um, as a national hockey I'll tell you referee. my last secret. Sure. <laughs> my last secret. And this is it. This is the, this is the, uh, this is the, the Albert Einstein secret. E equals MC squared. If you can skate and that's key and you can go through the whole game and not worry about whether you're forwards, backwards, left foot, right foot, turning inside, turning outside. If you can maneuver and skate all night long and you're one of the best skaters out there, there'll always be a job for you. Certainly. Like I said, we appreciate your time and um, I guess good luck and, and, in your in your future uh, uh, adventures here, and uh, certainly we uh, we hope to hear from you down the road. <laughs> All right, see ya. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thank Take you. care. Right, cheers. I know.